You've probably noticed I'm troubled, he said. I look past that, I answered while shyly staring ahead. Talk about the things you're ashamed of. Talk about your identity. Talk about who you are, despite not being accepted by your parents, your friends, society. Talk about your mental illnesses. Talk about your trauma. Talk about everything that makes other people cringe and look at you funny. Voices to hear. Hey guys and welcome to Voices to Hear, I'm Kacper Krul and today we are talking with Dolores Popovich. He is an actor, a singer, web creator on TikTok platform where he has over 80,000 followers. Welcome! Hi, thank you for having me, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for coming, maybe there is something else in general you would like to add about yourself? Um, sure, um, thank you for using my birth name. I do, however, have recently started going by an alternative name, which is Leo. I am also a feminist and a rebel and a daydreamer, <laughs> worthy of mention. Uh, okay, but the first maybe let's talk about your profession. Uh, you graduated from the Skopje Theatre School. I know there is uh, only one public theatre school. It is difficult to get to? Yes, actually, I graduated at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts, which is a public school, correct? And it's actually very hard to get in because it's uh, we have another academy, but that requires a lot of money to get in. And as you know, the financial situation in Macedonia isn't exactly like it's it's not something you would envy if you were from another country. It's very difficult to get in. There are approximately like 200 people trying to get in every year and only around 10 succeed. And I can say proudly without any false modesty that I was um, I was top of the list when I when I got in, in my generation. And it's very difficult. There's the first round where they test your sense of rhythm. They test whether you know how to sing and stay on beat. And uh, you show whether you can dance, whether you can give them a neutral body to work with. Uh, you have a monologue you need to prepare. There is a, a test with general questions and an essay on why you want to become an actor. And, and the test about history of uh, yes, theater. Yes, yes, history of Only theater. Only about Macedonia or, uh, oh, around no, the, the world? the entire world. They want to know how educated you are on the topics that you would like to study while being there. And it's very difficult to get in, but I prepared for a very long time. In fact, I was mentally prepared since I was six. Do you remember this period when you prepared for the exams? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I love how I... <laughs> I did the role of uh, Lyubov Andreevna. Oh, I don't know the name in, Ma in, in English, in Macedonian, it's Vishnova Gradina. Is it like a, a cherry or orchard? It's cherry orchard, yes. And um, I did Lyubov Andreevna, which is a woman who was abandoned by her husband in a, in a terrible financial situation. And I remember that during my monologue, I needed to show that I was heartbroken and abandoned, that I was crying. My boyfriend had just left me, so that really helped. So that's how I remember this entire period of it preparing. It was a big deal for you. It was a very big... I was 18. It was the biggest heartbreak a person can experience, you know? Like, my partner left me, so... It was, it was very interesting, and I... Honestly, I love what I do. The monologue was from which book? Uh, Cherry Orchard, ah. from Chekhov. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mikhail Chekhov. Uh, one of my favorite writers, and um, which was very challenging for an 18-year-old. I would probably be much better now at 26, and probably even better when I'm like 40, if I live that long, you know. <laughs> okay, so um, I can ask you, uh, what made you decide to get into drama school? It's a very interesting story. I was six years old, and I saw a movie called Walk Towards the Light. It's about a little boy who has hereditary AIDS from his mother. And they just know they're going to lose him. And this entire movie is about the stigma he faces throughout life. And I didn't really... I, I've never seen the entire movie. But I remember seeing the ending where his mother... Spoiler alert. It's a movie from the 70s, so it's not a spoiler. I remember his mother is holding him and cradling him and keeps telling him to walk towards the light. And I sat there shaking in my boots, thinking, 
And I know it sounds ridiculous and abstract to say that a six-year-old would have this thought process, but I was six and I was sitting there in front of the TV thinking, these are the types of emotions I would like to evoke in people. And also I was an avid reader. I started reading when I was four and I was one of those weird ass kids who just were stuck in their rooms under the blanket with like a lamp reading <laughs> when you're supposed to be sleeping. And I, I d didn't really have many friends and I always felt like I didn't know who I was. So to me, acting felt like a way to live out as many lives as I can and be all of those heroes from the books that I read when I was little. So that's how I decided. Yeah, it's good because a lot of people change their plans. So uh, you oh, made these yeah. plans when you... When I was six, yeah, yeah. yes. And I never changed my mind about it, like ever. Never mm -hmm. thought that there might be something else for me. Okay, but for now, would you consider yourself an artist? Absolutely. I think everyone who creates something born of emotion is an artist. So I would absolutely consider myself an artist. And what does art mean to you? Everything. God, everything. It's such a... What does it mean everything? Uh, I feel like art is a reason to live. You can... Total anarchy could rule, you know? But I, I really honestly feel... Capitalism tells you that you can't live without money because money is food, money is shelter, money is everything. Honestly, I think you can live without anything, live off the grid, and but you can't survive without art. You really can't. And I think quarantine has really showed us that because we realized how important it was for us while locked away in our homes, how important it was for us to have some sort of an outlet or something to look forward to when we wake up in the morning, a film, a good song, a nice book. And I'm only talking about like the general meaning of art. There are so many other things that are also art. Uh, what was the study at the drama school like? Uh, well, honestly, it was very difficult. Um, it's four years of studying, uh, of studies, and um, I was there for about 15 hours a day. Didn't have time to shower. Yeah, <laughs> didn't have time to shower. I lost like 20 kilos, which is like 40 pounds. Um, you're there constantly, and from morning to evening, and until you go to bed, really, that's all you think about, the character you're given, the role you're given. You have to live with that person that you have to live as. And um, sure, there were breaks in between, but what's a break? You know, you just have coffee with your friends and you go right back into this world that this faculty has created for you. It's very different from normal universities, like the people you go with, your colleagues, they become a family to you. And you know, with family, you have a lot of you have a lot of fights, a lot of arguments, things get heated and you're upset with them. And honestly, you spend so much time there that you're just upset in and of itself, you know, not even with them. Uh, but just as with family, you love them nonetheless. I will never forget those people. They become, they became siblings to me, despite our disagreements and despite the fact that I don't have a single person there that I would consider a close friend. I'm not in contact with anyone, but they are my family. They will forever be my family. We um, we studied a speech. We paid a lot of a lot of attention to speech, to enunciation and pronunciation, uh, using our diaphragm as like a tool, uh, neutralizing our body to be able to fit into the shape of any role you have to perform. Uh, we did a lot of dancing. We did a lot of uh, stage falls, like how to do a barrel roll to fall. You know. Uh, how to fall properly without hurting yourself. We did TV acting as well, I mean, screen acting, but we mainly focused on stage acting. What was your favorite subject? Uh, just my uh, uh, theater acting, stage acting. That was, that was my favorite subject, definitely. Okay, like uh, I know something about um, this kind of field, like theater school, because when I was young, it was my dream to be an actor. Yeah, but my plans change a bit. Uh, yeah. Ah, maybe not. Like I'm, <laughs> uh, but uh, I have a lot of friends. Uh, they finished um, theater study. They told me that uh, there is specific atmosphere. Uh, what Definitely. do you uh, What do you think about it? Uh, and uh, do you think uh, people in theater school um, they are more open for others? Absolutely. I feel like it's a very safe space for the queer and the mentally ill. It's um. 
we're artists. We're tortured artists. We're bohemians. It's uh, if you didn't drink alcohol or smoke weed before going there, you'll start. I'm living example and proof of that, you know. And, um, and also, if professors are not, oh, it's... No. well, some of them, some <laughs> of them. I have to be honest. Some of them, absolutely. Like, there's a different atmosphere. Meaning, um, you spend so much time together. You see each other fart and burp, and you 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 stink, and you see each other naked in in the changing rooms, and that creates a certain type of intimacy that other faculties, universities, colleges don't offer. And your teachers are practically your best friends. Like you don't address them formally. Everything just feels like a tightly knit family. It's a very different atmosphere from normal schools. And honestly, I loved it. At the time, I hated it. Now I would give anything to go back to it, you know? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, change the topic a bit. Um, for the people who don't know, uh, can you explain what being non-binary means and how you identify it? Uh, here's the thing. I would say that the closest thing I identify to is in fact being non-binary. I can't speak on behalf of the entire trans community because it's a very individual experience. Whether you're cis or straight or queer in any way, it's always an individual experience. But for myself, I can say that, well, in general, being non-binary means that you don't identify as the gender you were born as. Now, you might identify a bit more as the other one. You might identify as someone who is in between, perhaps you're gender fluid, so yeah, you, you identify as both simultaneously, or um, some people just don't enjoy their pronouns. And you can, non-binary is like, a lot of people have that toxic mindset that if you're non-binary, you have to look androgynous, you have to appear to be neither gender, you know, but I, I think that's false. I think that non-binary people don't owe androgyny to anyone you don't owe society anything you can look any way you look for me personally i uh, i've always known i wasn't a girl ever since i was little i was at a birthday party an all girls birthday party at my best friend's place and i remember thinking i don't belong here and not in the internalized misogyny i belong outside with the boys playing sports girls are too much drama none of that but just a gut feeling of not belonging there and for me being non-binary just means that i will never look in the mirror and see a woman i look in the mirror and see a person occasionally i see a boy i have the type of gender dysphoria when i look at my face i don't see a girl's face i see a boy and that's why my pronouns are they he my preferred pronouns are they but if you're gonna use a binary Uh, uh, a binary pronoun or speak to me in a binary language such as Macedonian and most Slavic languages uh, he would be the right way to go like she just makes me uncomfortable people sometimes make mistakes and they slip up but it always like hits the back of my head like something is wrong it's off like, some of them don't understanding things you know yes, so. <laughs> yes absolutely I don't judge anyone based on whether they use or don't use my pronouns So being non-binary can be very, like many different things to answer your question more um, precisely. Uh, it can just mean that you don't identify as the gender you were born. You identify more as the other one, but you don't want to fully transition into the other one. You can identify as both and you can identify as neither. More like the other, more like the one you were assigned at birth. For me personally, I am a male aligned non-binary person, which means that I see myself as just a person who strives a bit more to be masculine rather than feminine. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. um, what we can do in every day to, to help trans community? Just be more accepting and start by being respectful of their pronouns. I had a debate uh, yesterday, in fact, with uh, someone I'm working with at the moment. We had a little bit of a heated debate where he insisted that, oh, why should I respect someone if they don't respect me? It's so easy to just respect someone, someone's identity. A person doesn't have to pass as the gender they identify with in order for you to respect their pronouns and their existence. Their pronouns are their, their identity and their identity is their existence. Who are you to disrespect that? But what we can do is offer shelter and talk about this uh, loud and proudly about who we are to, to like normalize it for Well, the one thing we can do is um, include queer people in media much more. Normalize it to the point where if a boomer, an old woman, were to see a trans person 
on the television, she would say, oh, this is normal, you know? She wouldn't cringe or like squint and just be like, oh, it's the trannies again. And by the way, I'm allowed to say that word because I'm one of them. <laughs> so um, that's, what, uh, that's how we can start. We can involve it in education. We can, we need to involve sexual education in school, sex education, in which we will talk about people who are queer. We can normalize people being born with an organ that doesn't fit who they feel they are. And if we talk to kids about this, if we normalize it, if we implement it as part of our structure and education in our system, that's when this society is going to be more accepting, when it's normalized. That's what we can do to help. And what do you think about nearest people like friends, family? Uh, for you, it's important to do coming out for these people and change a bit general life about um, knowledge about uh, LGBT uh, people? I am unfortunately one of the people who comes from a family that is very homophobic. My little sister knows everything about me, knows that I'm queer and accepts me fully, even uses my correct pronouns. Um, my father is a very spiritual man, so he sees me as a person. It doesn't matter what I tell him. I'm not ready quite to tell him. I've told him I'm non-binary. I've tried to explain to him, like, hey, dad, I'm not quite a girl. And he's always been like, oh, good. I've always wanted a son. So let's just say my father is... It's very nice. Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 from, from family. Yes, yes. It's like he, he respects my identity. My mother, however, I don't think I could ever tell her. I mean, I will have to eventually because I'm eventually going to be doing interviews. I'm going to be open about this. I'm going to talk about this. It's going to be stupid if my own mother can't listen to those and accept and respect me for who I am. For some people, it's very important that their family accepts them. For me, honestly, I found the community that accepts me to a point where I don't, I guess I don't need that. I need my mother to accept me, even as her daughter, despite me not being quite that. I found the community that accepts me. I have friends who accept me. I accept myself, and I don't care if someone else doesn't. No. I understand that for some people, it's very important. For me, it's not a vital part of who I am. My mother knowing, like, I don't care. It's 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 good. I totally understand. So let's back for your profession a bit. Um, I have a question, like, is it more difficult being an LGBT artist than a heteronormative one in, in Macedonia or general, maybe? Um, it is. It's, it's far more difficult to be an LGBT person in general rather than a heteronormative cis straight one. As an artist, it's even more difficult but I think you have the um, the motive of inspiring young queer people, which is like a very good drive when it comes to challenging the social norm. But it's very difficult, of course, just as in any country. it's uh, There's a lot of prejudice. A lot of people won't hire you based on the fact that you're using a name that's not your birth name. And you can't say, oh, that's my artistic name. They know. I'm open about this on Instagram, on TikTok, on all my social media. I have my preferred pronouns in my bio. And I have had, I have heard that people talk about me behind my back and people don't want to hire me because, oh, he's a tranny. Fuck that. It is far more difficult, just as it is for any person. It's it's more difficult to be an LGBT youth rather than a heteronormative one, of course. Did you have any problems about your character in theater? Absolutely, yes. One of the biggest challenges is I know for a fact that if I choose to never transition, which is quite a big option for me, if I choose to never fully succumb to the pressure of being, of fitting into the mold of a heteronormative society, I will forever be stuck playing female roles. Forever. I will always play a woman. I will be referred to as a she, her in every movie and every play. And it bothers me on one hand because my identity will never be respected especially not in a society such as this one. But on the other hand, it's a role. And I've played the female role for far too long to mind playing it for a tiny bit more, you know? I think you have to be proud about it because it's kind of challenge for you and mm -hmm. you can do it. So you have to be happy about yes, it. Yes, femininity is a performance and I don't mind even performing in everyday life. I, in, in professional social circles, I still go by she, her. Because I understand that these 50-year-old play directors are never going to respect my identity. And I don't care. I respect my own identity. I don't need external validation from someone. It doesn't make me less of who I am. And um, I still play female roles. I still, like, 
despite feeling like a boy and being a boy, I like to go out with my long hair and my painted nails and lipstick on and wearing a dress. And I don't care how the world views me, you know? I know what I see when I look in the mirror. I know what my partner sees. I know what my closest friends see. And that's all that matters. You are doing a lot of things in your life and I'm very happy about it. And I'm, I, I don't know how to, to be like you because... Uh, For example, I, uh, for now I want to talk about TikTok because you are <laughs> very famous, let's say. Um, so maybe the first question, how did your adventure with TikTok start and what inspired you to make your first movie? Um, it was during quarantine. I was very bored and very depressed. And I got so tired and annoyed with scrolling through Reddit every night. And I just thought I would download it. It was very, it was a very innocent move. I wasn't gonna create any videos. I wasn't gonna do anything. I just wanted to download it and see what the fuss is about. It turned out to be so fun. It was so fun. And then I thought to myself, maybe just add like one video where I'm lip singing. And then the really, the, the, the turning point for me was when I saw that there was a huge community of people there who were open about very stigmatized topics such as mental illness, being queer in a very heteronormative society, being um, having childhood trauma, having been through sexual assault. I saw these people talk about it very courageously and I thought to myself, maybe I should do this too. And I, I sort of... If you've been through my TikTok, you know that I... You are my reason that uh, <laughs> I download TikTok. Of course. <laughs> well, uh, you've seen it, so you know that I I cope through comedy. I like to make videos where I laugh about this, the things that I've been through. And honestly, I could not be more grateful for downloading TikTok during those boring times where I was stuck at home. We had a curfew at 5 p.m. We only had six hours where we could be outside. I needed to find a hobby. And I just started making videos. And I could not believe the amount of people that would relate to the things I would talk about. Because I mainly create content for people who have borderline personality disorder and who are queer, unaccepted, say shunned by society, people who don't fit the regular norm. Not in a, oh, I'm so quirky and different kind of way, just in a shunned by society, practically exiled by everyone kind of way. And so many people related and it just made me feel so less alone. And I think that my biggest motive behind creating my videos is to make others feel less alone. Yeah, I, I'm very happy about it and I'm very proud about you because like, I think for now we have a lot of hate speech mm -hmm. around the world. So it's good to show and learn something uh, in the good way, in the happy way, like you. Um, okay, so uh, what does a typical day of your work, work look like? Uh, uh, it's a question about TikTok, uh, not about oh, theater. TikTok. Yeah. Um, a typical day? Well, here's the thing. <laughs> My TikTok videos are very low effort. So I don't really spend much time on them. I usually just, while I'm in bed scrolling, bored and waiting for my partner to wake up, um, I run across like a sound I really like and an idea immediately pops into my head. All I do is I get up, I brush my teeth <laughs> and I record it in like 30 seconds and I just upload it and I just don't check it for a couple of hours because I, I don't like seeing if anyone has seen it. It's really, it's simple. I don't spend too much time on it. I spend more time scrolling than I do recording. So, and I'm currently... But I think it's really difficult to be uh, systematic and not regular, like every day, the, the movie. So it's not that easy, <laughs> like it's, you said. It's not easy. Sometimes, sometimes you get a creative block. Like, for instance, I don't think I've posted anything in a week. And the algorithm doesn't pick up on you as easy as it would if you posted daily. Sometimes you're just uninspired. Sometimes you're just depressed. What do you do in this period when you are un uninspired? I play my games. I'm an <laughs> I'm a gamer. I just I play my games. I spend hours talking to my partner on FaceTime since we're long distance. Um, they're from America, and uh, I I try to focus more on my music because even when I'm uninspired and depressed, 
music draws something out of me. So I, I do that more. I play my games. I lay in bed. I snack on stuff. You know, your usual unemployed bohemian artist bullshit. How do you think you impact the LGBT and non-LGBT youth uh, today through TikTok? Um, honestly, I don't think I impact the non-LGBT ones as much as I impact the queer ones. Possibly the non-LGBT <clears throat> ones through talking about my mental illness and raising awareness on the topic. But for the queer ones, since gaining a little bit of TikTok quote-unquote fame, I have had so many teenagers recognize me in the streets, in the park, in bars and just events. And I've had them coming up to me and going like, Leo, hi, I'm such a big fan. And thank you for talking about the things that you talk about because you have given me the courage to tell people that I'm trans. You have shown me that, for instance, I've had a person come up to me and be like, I've always known I was a boy. I'm afraid of transitioning. So I have never identified as one because I was afraid that society would shun me for not looking the way a boy should quote unquote look. But you have given me the courage to tell people that I am a boy, I'm a boy with breasts, I'm a boy with a vagina, but I'm still a boy. And I you've gave me you've given me the courage to use my preferred pronouns. I've had kids come up to me and talk to me. Uh they have been like they've told me like I was sexually assaulted and you've given me the courage to talk about that because unfortunately so have I several times throughout my life but I've talked about it openly and I've had kids come up to me and thank me for my courage to talk about it because it gives them to, the courage to talk about it and as we all know it's not a very easy t topic to talk about so the same way TikTok inspired me and gave me courage I strive to do the same for teenagers not just teenagers people older than me you know we all need a little bit of a push it's difficult to be that famous in, in Skopje, in the capital of Macedonia, because uh, it's a small background. We met in the restaurant in the city mm -hmm. center and two of my friends um, just come for this restaurant and they met you the first time and they were very happy about yeah. it. So I, I know that random people know who are you. It's difficult to be a person like, like this? Oh, not at all. Not at all. It's so nice. Um, I get recognized a lot. Not to sound like a diva, but I get recognized a lot. Like when I go to the park, which is like the common gathering place for today's youth, I go to the park with my friends and like I have kids like shyly approaching me, you know, they're all bashful and nervous. And my friends go like, oh, fuck, Leo, here we go again. <laughs> Fucking hell, you know, <laughs> like, and they come up to me and they go like, so I'm vaccinated. May I please have a hug? And like, we <laughs> hug it out. We talk about things sometimes. Well, the only thing that makes me a little uncomfortable, I have a lot of minors coming up to me and going like, would you like to hang out with us, like drink with us? And I have to go like, listen, I know I look 19. I'm in fact almost 30. I'm 26 of age. <laughs> so like, I can't hang out with you. I'm so sorry. So I have to turn down a lot of people who are trying to be my friends, but it's not hard at all. It's so nice. It's so nice to see how many people I inspire and how many people actually want to be my friend and just accept me into this small community. I love it. Sometimes you have used to because it's good. Always it's good to, to drink free alcohol. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. But not with 14 year olds. I, I'd yeah, much course, rather not course. go to I'm jail. Agree totally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you think TikTok changed your life? Absolutely. In so many ways. And I know, I know how stupid that must sound to someone who doesn't have it. Like, oh, it's, it's a social media platform. Like, how could it possibly change your life? Honestly, it gave me the courage to talk about my sexual assault, my mental illnesses, the fact that I'm queer. It gave me the courage to recognize that I'm queer because I was very closed off from all of that when I was younger. I have met so many wonderful people through it. I've made so many friendships, so many lasting friendships. I know you a bit and for now I want to ask you about um, other other things, other topic. Can you explain what is borderline personality disorder and what is like living with this illness? Of course, if you want. Of course, I, I love talking about it because it helps to destigmatize it. We should all talk about it. Um, borderline personality disorder is more often than not characterized by uh, very severe mood swings, very severe oscillations between mania and depression, 
and um, a very f flimsy sense of self, like almost uh, a lack of identity, a lack of firm ground on who you are as a person, and um, a lot of emotional deregulation. For instance, I, I have a hard time regulating intense emotions, and in BPD, most emotions are intense. It's if you open if you were to open a Wikipedia article about BPD, the first sentence is borderline personality disorder is a severe mental illness. So it's not something to be taken lightly. It's not just depression. It's not just mania. It's not and I'm not trying to discredit or like devalue the meaning of what it means to be depressed. Some people are catatonic and they don't they can't handle it without meds or therapy. But this this is a personality disorder. This is something that completely makes you who you are. And it's exceptionally difficult to live with it. Um, it's very difficult to form long-lasting friendships, to have healthy relationships with people, to just have a healthy life. Because things that are normal and a given to other people are almost impossible for people with BPD. Almost impossible. Not just BPD, people with autism, people who are bipolar. It's people who have CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It's uh, just getting out of bed in the morning is a task that requires far more energy than it would for a neurotypical person. Do you also sharing with these things for your followers in TikTok? Yes, most of my contact, uh, most of my content revolves around the fact that I have a mental illness, and um, I found that many people relate, and I've had a lot of them comment things like, "Thank you for talking about this very openly," because it is. If you were to Google how to live with borderline personality disorder or like how to help or like help personality disorder, you know, something like that, most of the search results would be how to get rid of an abusive BPD partner. It's demonized completely or like how to completely cut off a BPD friend from your life. It's one of the mental illnesses where the person who has it, much like with ASPD, antisocial personality disorder, it's something that people consider narcissistic and terrible and a person who has it is often demonized and just painted as the abuser, which is really not the case. We're just fucked up people looking for our own peace of mind, you know? Yeah, of course. So maybe for now, um, we can. I, I want to ask you about uh, your profession and this... Uh, I uh, think, uh, has this uh, illness in any way affect your art and relationship? Absolutely. I don't think I would be an artist, an artist if I wasn't mentally ill. I think that the best art stems from pain. And BPD is the type of uh, disorder that comes from childhood abuse and neglect. So if there, if there wasn't any pain to begin with, I never would have been mentally ill. I probably would have been your ordinary average Joe who wakes up in the morning, goes to his nine to five, comes back home to his wife or husband or kids or whatever, and just leads a normal balanced life. But I think that it was precisely my need for the extremes, which is uh, often a symptom of BPD. You, you look for things that are extreme, and that will bring you immense joy or immense pain. It's it's particularly that which makes you it, it it almost forces you to become an artist as an outlet for what you're feeling and cannot express in a different way. So of course it has impacted my art. I wouldn't be an artist without it. I know it's difficult to explain about it, um, but I want to ask you what is something you wish people knew about border personality disorder to to better understand people who, who live with it? Um, what's really important to understand is that a person, more often than not, a person with BPD has the same intelligence as you, per se, has the same physical and mental maturity as you, but not the same emotional maturity. It's very important to understand. So it's most about emotion. Yes, yes, it's based on emotions mainly. Like we're rational, most of us are fully rational people, fully rational, high fun function adults who contribute to this capitalist society. But the we have the emotional maturity of a five-year-old. 
practically a toddler. Like, things that wouldn't normally hurt a neurotypical person will likely kill a severely mentally ill one, which is what a BPD person is. That is something I wish people knew. That is something I wish people knew in order for them to be more cautious with people who are mentally ill. And for the listeners out there, if your partner, your friend, your family member has a mental illness, read up on it. Educate yourself in order to improve their life and your coexistence with them. Uh, how can we destigmatize uh, mental illness about this topic? Like this, by talking about it. Just talking. Yes, yes. Well, not just talking, not like, oh, I went to a party and talked to my friends about it. I met someone and I went like, oh, I have borderline personality disorders. Do you want me to like tell you about it? <laughs> not quite like that, but we could have panel discussions. We could um, create art, particularly per se movies that don't portray it as something that's so demonized and so stigmatized. We could have like, we could have mentally ill people have discussions and debates where they educate on the topic. We could include it in our educational systems where our teachers talk to us from a very young age about what it means to be bipolar, borderline, autistic, um, antisocial personality disorder, dissociative personality disorder. You can like, uh, sorry, the dissociative identity disorder. If our teachers were to talk to us about that, to us while we're growing up, if our parents were to talk to us about that, we would grow into better people. We would grow into a better society that is fully destigmatized mental illness. I think that's what we need to do. Include it in education first and have parents be educated on the topic enough to talk to their kids about it. And then we'll have this not quite utopian this, uh, society, but a fully functional one, an accepting one. Yeah, I totally agree. We have to do as much as possible. I want to do personality as much as possible in my life to to change these things about it uh, for my friends, for my family, for everybody. Um, okay, so I want to ask you, how has your life been living here in Macedonia? Is there something you wish had been different? And what are your aspirations for the future? Here's the thing. I love Macedonia. I love our culture, I love our folklore, I love our food, I love the people, they're warm and they're welcoming, just like in most Balkan countries. Yeah, people here are amazing. Right? <laughs> I right? totally amazing. agree, they are really open and sometimes, uh, like for example in Poland, if you want to meet your friends, you have to make a schedule. You have to ask, do you have a free time the next week or something so oh, you have to no, think about it no, but here it was like <laughs> I was really shocked about it that when we met people and everybody want to meet us every day <laughs> so yeah, for yeah. me sometimes it was difficult it was kind of too much but it's 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 really yeah it's really good <laughs> that's exactly what I love about Macedonia the people here have such an adventurous spontaneous spirit Like, your friend could call you up at 5 a.m. and be like, do you want to come drink wine with me up on, like, the train tracks? And you'd be like, yeah, sure, just let me, you know, wake up a little and stretch and have, like, five minutes of coffee and a cigarette and then I'm going to come over. I love Macedonia. I really do. Not in the patriotic sense of the word. Just, like, it's so warm and it's so welcoming and it's home. And I'm the type of person that, like, my roots are here. I grew up here and I will always be sentimentally attached to it. This is my home. I've started something here. I've started a career. Most people from my group of actors and directors and producers know me here. I don't want to go somewhere and start all over again. I don't want... I think we planted a, an inspiring seed for the generations to come. And I hope that Gen Z will save not just Macedonia, but the world. I really hope they will. Last question, uh, oh, okay. before surprise, All right. <laughs> uh, so uh, in general, what is your message uh, you would like to express to the listeners of this podcast? Talk about the things that make you uncomfortable. Talk about the things you're ashamed of. Talk about your identity. Talk about who you are, despite not being accepted by your parents, your friends, society. Talk about your mental illnesses. Talk about your trauma. Talk about everything that makes other people cringe and look at you funny. And dream big. If people aren't laughing at your dreams, 
They're not big enough. I don't know who said that, but it must have been a very clever man or woman or a non-binary person. <laughs> it's a good ending, I think. It's Thank really you. good and I'm very happy about you are my guest today. And so glad I to be here. want to say thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> for now, um it's it will be a surprise for mm-hmm. our listeners because you are a um, s- singer. Yeah. Uh, and I know you made a lot of an orig- original songs. Yeah. Uh, so maybe do you want to show your talent for oh, us? Absolutely. I brought my uke. Yes. Um, I'm going to perform a song called Rebels with a Cause. I wrote it very recently. What is about this song? The song is about... Um, I met my partner through TikTok. We haven't even seen each other yet, but honestly, this person is the best thing to ever happen to me. So he really inspired me to write about how much of a similar struggle we've had, because that is exactly what bonded us, how similar we are and the things that we've been through. And the song is about our collective solitude as we have been like shunned from the world, the rest of the world. There's a line in it that says, um, we're just two orphaned lovers, two rebels with a cause. Because he is also, like me, on his own personal emotional revolution, his own mission to make other people feel less so- lonely. So yeah, that's what the song is about. Okay, I know it will be great. So for our listeners, if you are in your home or something like cozy place, let's let's go, let's sit in comfortable place and just enjoy this time this is rebels with a cause for trevor specifically (laughs) you've probably noticed i'm troubled he said i'll look past that i answered while shyly staring ahead Softly beating next to mine You probably noticed I'm frightened, he said Same bullet passed through us both when we were young And your heart has since bled Took twenty Rest your head. 